Okay, so the follow-up Douglas Adams Memorial episode. This is part four of the trilogy on multi-image panoramas. As I said at the end of the last episode, there was quite a bit of feedback regarding the three videos that preceded this one. And in this episode, we're just going to look at some of those comments and uh, just have a quick chat about that. So, let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 76 of Understanding Dark Table. So this is going to be short. I am not going to labor the point, And with a couple of the really long comments, I will suggest that you just pause the video for a second so that you can read the entire comment, uh, because I'm not going to sit there and read the entire things out. Okay, let's go. Number one. Uh, so these start at episode 73. Secret Life of Matt said, good stuff, Bruce. Of course, if you don't have a remote shutter release, you can use your camera's timer to avoid camera shake. I cannot believe I didn't even think of that. Of course, absolutely. If you've got any kind of camera that has all of the minimum requirements that I addressed in episode 73, i.e. manual exposure, manual shutter release, you know, I manual focus, then yes, it's more than likely going to have a two second and 10 second timer. And most of the time, a two second timer will be just adequate. So secret life of Matt. Thank you. Next, Hersha Narayan. Bruce, can you comment on using A-E-L-A-F-L while taking pictures for Pano? I use this to maintain the same exposure limit. Thanks. So A-E-L is auto exposure lock, and I'm assuming A-F-L means auto focus lock. And as I said in my comment back to him, auto exposure lock is basically the same as doing manual exposure. The only critical part there is that if you're going to use auto exposure lock, much in the same way as doing manual exposure, is just make sure you take your reading on the brightest part of what is going to be in the sequence. You know, if one particular end is going to be brighter than the other, then make sure that that's where you take your auto exposure reading from before you engage auto exposure lock. And focus lock, again, I would assume would do the same thing as manual focus. I'm don't think the Sony has an autofocus lock as such. Um, but yeah, it would be much the same deal. Decide what aperture you're going to shoot at. Decide how far into your scene you want to focus and lock your focus off and then go ahead and shoot your sequence. So yeah, hope that helps. Uh, number three, this is from Charles Hacker. I suggest you just pause the video and quickly read Charles's comment. And as I said to Charles, I wasn't aware of the link between Lightroom and Emblend, but there you go. That doesn't surprise me that Adobe has used Emblend in Lightroom's panorama stitching module slash algorithm, whatever you want to call it. Um, glad you're including Hugan in here because there are not too many videos on it. I absolutely concur on that. I've been looking for tutorials on Hugan and haven't really come across anything that goes particularly in depth. Um, if anyone has seen a good Hugan tutorial, uh, please feel free to sing out and share the love because I'm sure there are other people who would like to know as well. Uh, as I said, you know, in oh, if it's not this comment, it must have been another comment. I, I covered what I know of Hugan, and that's not a great deal. I sort of know the basics, and I can produce my you know, single-row panos. And I have since mucked around with uh, a two-row pano, uh, and that's stitched together beautifully. Uh, and maybe in the new year, I might get around to doing another video where we do multi-row, and yeah, I'll, I'll try and explore some of the more esoteric types of panorama shooting. Okay, moving on. Andreas Weigel said, what I do for overlap is I use the focus points in the viewfinder. I take the picture. Look at where the right focal point is. In other words, in the first frame he's shot. 
and then move the camera so that his middle focus point is where the right focus points were on the previous frame. So basically a 50% overlap. Um, also helps when you do freehand to keep the camera somewhat level. Yeah, sometimes, but not always, Andreas. Maybe it's just me. I know that I have tried that method and sometimes I've still managed to mess it up. Mostly in the the whole roll aspect you know where i've i've shot one frame here and i've shot the next frame there but i have not managed to keep the horizon absolutely square in each frame and of course then when you come to trying to stitch them together hugan just goes what is this crap <laughs> and it all goes pear-shaped so uh, i guess as long as you are able to keep the horizon level then you can get away with it all right next uh, this is one that i will let you pause the video and read through okay interesting point about working with jpegs I, i'm not a fan but i can appreciate that yes you can get away with it my hesitation there is the fact that it's an 8-bit format it's already lossy and you know i don't like seeing lossy assets used in a production workflow as you guys know i'm an audio engineer by trade and you know we absolutely will go out of our way not to use mp3 files in a production workflow because we know that they're going to get rendered and then get compressed for delivery or distribution. Uh, and I hate seeing lo lossy assets used twice in a production workflow, you know, w once for production and then once more for delivery. Each to their own. The other, the other problem too with an 8-bit format like JPEG is just the limited range of you know, tonal range. So you can't really pull and push a JPEG as aggressively as you can a RAW file. The moment you start getting aggressive with tonal changes on a JPEG, you immediately start to introduce banding in the finished product. And, you know, if you're going to end up with banding in the finished product, why bother going through all the effort of creating the panorama? You know, each to their own. I, I, you know, I completely get, you know, everyone has their own threshold for these things, you know. For me, it's raw or nothing. As for the ball head, I, I don't know. I, I kind of get the impression, Elho, that you didn't understand what I was talking about, that there are some heads that, you know, they mount on the top of your tripod and then they just have one... Uh, hang on. If got, I think I've got one here. Yeah, yeah. So, so like a, you know, like that type of ball head where you just undo one thing and then it pivots. So you don't have three axis control. And you know, if your camera is then mounted on the top of that, and even if you've got, you know, the the top of your tripod somehow rotated over, uh, so your camera is in a portrait orientation and you're you're doing this and you're sorry to be facing away from from me if, if my scene was out there and then you're panning through the scene like that the point is you've still got the ability to deliberately or inadvertently adjust the camera on more than one axis and that's what we don't want you know that's what i was saying about having a man or a head like my manfrotto 465 is that i can lock off two of those axes and then only affect your where a ball head you've you don't have that ability to lock off those other two axes that's what i was getting at and i think maybe you'd didn't quite understand or, or maybe I'm not understanding your comment but anyway I've said my bit on that uh, the point around which you want to rotate the camera and lens is called the no parallax point not the nodal point well eh, okay I've heard of the no parallax point but I've also heard people refer to it as the nodal point um I, I, I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule on that or not but I'll take your word for it 
this is unfortunately a common misconception among photographers. Okay. The no parallax point is at the center of the virtual entrance pupil of the optical system, which was basically what I was trying to explain in episode 73. Yeah, good point regarding the control points. It, it really does come down to how many you know, definite correlation points you can find between successive frames. And if you've got good common areas in successive frames and they are at least a reasonable distance apart so that you can say, well, here's, here's four common points between these two frames. And if those four points are, are reasonably well spaced out, then Hugen goes, okay, well, those four points map to those four points and it all works. So yeah, absolutely. Interesting thoughts regarding the wider angle lenses. Uh, I will have to investigate now that I've got the nodal ninja to play with. Uh, Certainly, it has been my experience using, you know, up until now, just my Manfrotto head where I wasn't able to rotate my camera over the no parallax point, uh, that using wider focal lengths certainly caused more problems, but maybe that's exacerbated by not rotating around the no parallax point. I don't know. So... I, now, now that I have the Nodal Ninja to play with, I'll have to go and give it a go with my 15mm wide angle and see how it goes. The second last paragraph, I, I, I have to say, you kind of lost me there because I'm not really sure <laughs> what you're talking about. Uh, a single rail with a clamp at its end that goes between... The clamp of the tripod here. No, no, sorry, you lost me. Uh, and the last bit, tip for the beginners without a tripod, pinch the protruding lens between the index finger and thumb of your left hand while holding the camera normally with your right and rotate the camera around that pivot point watching the display for parallax artifacts and fine-tuning the position of your fingers to minimize them. Foreground will still not match up when stitching, but at least the mid-ground and background will do noticeably better than any arbitrary rotation. Yeah, good points. Good points. All right, let's move along. Uh, the first paragraph is obviously a response to Anthony Scraber, which was a different comment altogether. With regards the... Yeah, night images, okay. I suppose the exposure would remain reasonably consistent. You're talking about using evaluated matrix metering. I'm still concerned that from frame to frame, the camera might change the exposure. Now, if you're using Hugen to stitch and Hugen has the ability to do exposure compensation as it blends successive frames together, you might get away with it. But I personally would rather just go with manual exposure and know that every single frame matches for exposure. Uh, even though there might be quite radical changes across the width of the entire sequence, there's a consistency there. Any kind of automatic exposure worries me when it comes to multi-image panoramas because you only need, you know, one, one bright thing. It might be the sun reflecting off one window of a building amongst a city skyline that could inadvertently cause the camera's light meter to go, oh, hang on, suddenly things are really bright and then, you know, make the shutter speed a whole lot faster and thereby, you know, knock the exposure down on that one frame compared with all the other frames in the sequence, you know, and that's a headache I would just rather not have. But if matrix metering works for you, knock yourself out. Okay, regarding the histogram, I would have said the same thing, that the histogram on your camera generally reflects the in-camera JPEG, and if you are seeing the same sort of histogram displayed in Fast Raw Viewer, when you get back to your production machine, laptop, desktop, whatever it happens to be, 
my guess is that it's using the same settings from the raw file that were used to create the in-camera JPEG. Now, I'm, I might be wrong. I don't know. I, and, and I'm not a Nikon shooter, so or Nikon, as the Americans would say. I, so, you know, it might be something about how Nikon produces its, ca- uh, its in-camera JPEGs. I'll leave that to you, Mr. T. If that has been your experience, then by all means, run with that. Uh, good point regarding the white card, uh, which is, as I mentioned in episode 73, we use that to take a white balance reading. Obviously, yeah, a bit hard. As for nighttime panoramas, my recommendation is just shoot daylight. Even if it's a cityscape where you've got a lot of artificial light, I would say shoot daylight white balance. And if you're shooting raw, I mean, yeah, you can always change it after the fact anyway. But yeah, my my feeling on that has always been I'm going to shoot daylight white balance when in doubt because, I don't know, the human eye just seems to, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how to put it into words, but I've never been let down, let me say that, by shooting a daylight white balance even when I wasn't technically in daylight, you know, like shooting a nighttime cityscape or something like that. But again, each to their own, whatever works for you. As you mentioned before, would this be the right approach to solve the scenario described above, set the desired white balance in one of the exposures that is to be in the pano and apply it to all the other exposures? Absolutely. As I've just said, though, my recommendation is pick a white balance and then shoot all of your frames with that. Now, if you like shooting in auto white balance or you always shoot auto white balance and you just forgot to change to a white balance preset at the time, as long as you were shooting RAW, it's not going to matter because when you're preparing your RAW files to export them as TIFFs in order to stitch them in Hugen, you can synchronize the white balance across all of those frames, even if they were shot with auto white balance and therefore the color temperature has changed, you know, a little bit between images within the sequence. Uh, It's easy enough to then just go, okay, this particular frame is the the hero frame out of the entire sequence. So I'm just going to set a white balance of X for this particular frame, and then I'm going to copy those values to all the other frames in the sequence. And then you know that, you know, the white balance is consistent across the entire sequence of images. And a final word to Bruce, who's putting his time and effort to produce this series of Understanding Darktable. A huge thank you for your efforts, even if I, in 99.9% of my editing needs, rely on Adobe Lightroom. (sighs) Traitor. Traitor. (laughs) I'm doing a slow transition to some standalone freeware, though I'm not keen of the subscription model of Adobe. Thank you so much. Mr. T, not a problem, mate. And I'm glad that, you know, you found this series helpful, even if you are still on the other side of the fence. We'll forgive you. You'll you'll be over here eventually. (laughs) All right, moving on. Uh, Halgir Kionis Renevum. Renavam, Ren, Rene, Renavaman. I've obviously butchered that completely, and Helgear, my absolute apologies, mate. <laughs> Use center, fit, and straighten button on move drag, and by move drag, he's referring to the tab inside Hugen that is called move and drag. So when you go to that particular tab, there are buttons for center, fit and straighten uh, to auto align and fit the image after the stitching process. I had seen those buttons and had just not really even thought to click on them. So after I saw your comment, Helgia, I went and had a look at that. And hey, what do you know? Does a great job. (laughs) So thank you. I learned something from you guys. That's awesome. Uh, And next, Timur Raymond, what about lens correction? Should it be on? Uh, And I think it was Halgia who said in another comment that I think we're still coming to, 
mentioned that Hugen actually does really good lens correction by itself. So you actually don't need to apply lens correction in Darktable prior to exporting your TIFF files. So there we go. Alrighty, Mr. T again. Way too many steps for me, Bruce. It'll take me the rest of my life to learn this process. I thought that the whole shebang could be done in Darktable. Unfortunately not. Uh, more so, I thought you would show us how to do multi-row panos. Single row panos I can very simply make in Lightroom. And I said, you know, each to their own. But to be honest, if you've got the ability to rotate your camera and lens over the no parallax or nodal point, uh, then doing a multi-row pano is really not much more difficult than doing a single row pano. Uh, but like I said, maybe in the new year, I'll get out, shoot another video where we do a multi-row pano uh, and I can show you just how simple it is. All right. Stephen Ward said, really useful video as ever. Would you use lens correction before exporting for Hugen? Looking at the difference lens correction makes to my individual images, it would seem that straightening your images would help Hugen to do an even better job. And as we can see, third comment down, how Gear said, have used Hugen since the beginning. I would never recommend lens correction on the source images since Hugen does a better job itself. So... There we go. Uh, I have never used lens correction when I've prepared my source images uh, to export as TIFFs ready to stitch them. And I've managed to produce quite a few very successful panoramas out of Hugum without having applied any lens correction. So I'll take Hal Geraghty's word that Hugum handles all of that for itself. Okay, next up, uh, Todd Pryor commented, this was on the Darktable unofficial group on Facebook. Uh, great video, Bruce. For anyone on Windows, you can also give Microsoft Ice a try for your stitching. It's free research software and very straightforward yet powerful, and it can, I think that's meant to be do rather than to, do stop action panos from video as a bonus. Wow, okay. This is a nice little video from someone using it for Astro. So basically, as Bruce has done, but ICE could be an option for Windows users for the stitching part. There you go. Not sure if anyone has compared ICE versus Hugen. Maybe a Christmas time killer. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Nice little tip there. Uh, Ken Lidden said, one question, Bruce. I noticed that when you prepped your images in Darktable, you didn't use lens correction. Okay, so quite a few people have got a thing about lens correction. Uh, uh, and I'll just say again, apparently we really don't need it that much because Hugen does all that for itself. Uh, I do know that you were using a 50mm lens versus my 35mm and you're using a 50% overlap versus my 30%. So those probably imply the need for little, if any, lens correction. Quite possibly. I do think that the more overlap you shoot, then the easier you make life for Hugen when it comes to the stitching part. Simply because all, well, I think most lenses will introduce some sort of linear distortion. And so the more overlap you include between frames, then, yeah, it just means that you because let's think about it most of the distortion is happening out at the edges of any given frame that you shoot right you've shot a a portrait orientation frame for your pano most of the distortion is going to be on the very extremes of the frame so the more overlap the less we have to rely on those edge pixels that's my experience anyway and finally from Ua Lintula about the hot pixels, but I guess you know. If you paste the hot pixels module on your images in dark table and regenerate the TIFFs, you can just open your PTO file in Hugen and regenerate your output. All the sync points and other parameters are in the project file. The output will be exactly corresponding to the original, so even your XMP file in Darktable will be valid. What a great point. 
And yes, I should have recognised that and just didn't even think about it. I will at some point uh, go and do exactly that, regenerate the TIFF files with the hot pixels module applied and recreate the, the stitched version of the pano. Um, yeah, yeah, great tip, uh, Yuha. Thank you. Yeah, nice one. All righty. That is all of your questions and comments and bits of feedback, and I've even learned a couple of things. So thank you to you guys. Um, it's been a been an interesting series. This little four part trilogy on <laughs> multi image panos. Uh, as I'm recording this, it is December the eighth, and. In 11 days' time, on the 19th, I'm flying out to Western Australia for five days to see my dad and other members of my family who I have not seen for five years. So uh, I'm hoping before I go, <laughs> and, and this is a big ask because I've just got so much stuff going on right now, but I'm hoping before I go to grab one of the latest builds of 3.3, brush up on all of the new features uh, that will be in 3.4, and produce a Darktable 3.4 new features video based on a late build of 3.3, so that come Christmas Day or Boxing Day, whenever the release is, uh, I've got the video ready to go. Now... Like I said, that's my aim. I may get there, I may not. Uh, if I don't, I certainly will not be producing that video when I arrive home on Christmas Eve because I will be looking forward to seeing my wife and my son. Uh, and if that is the case, then it'll be a few days later before I can get that video done. So we'll play it by ear. But my aim is to try and get that done before I go to Western Australia. All right, I think that does it. Uh, if I don't speak to you before Christmas, have a good one. Merry Christmas. Uh, eat lots. Drink responsibly or not, as you see fit. Socially distance. Be safe. And, uh, yeah, I will catch you in the next one. See ya.